In 1941, Orson Welles wrote, directed, and starred in an emotionally charged drama that would arguably become the greatest film of all time. In 2020, we throw it back to one of our first loves from the world of bourbon. The film is Citizen Kane. The whiskey is Eagle Rare. And we'll review them both. This is the Film and Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week, for your Labor Day weekend, we are visiting, perhaps, the greatest film of all time, 1941's Citizen Kane. Brad, we have finally arrived at the moment that I have been waiting for. I held off on this movie as long as I possibly could. I'm really glad, to be honest, though, that we waited three years or three seasons to get into Citizen Kane because, you know, this movie has so much of a, of a baggage that comes along with it being called the greatest film ever made that I think you really do need a pretty extensive background in watching movies before you even get to this one to determine, like, does it hold up? Is it the best movie of all time? I don't know if this was a movie that we could have jumped right into in season one. Yeah, honestly, Bob, there there's a lot of movies that I feel like you kind of need to see leading up to this to really allow you to capture the importance of this movie. But I'll be honest with you, for me personally, having grown up watching older movies, this is like right in my wheelhouse. I mean, when you have an old movie where the whole beauty of the movie isn't just flashy you know, CGI that you get in modern films, but it's the actual acting. It's the actual script. Yeah, I'm I'm all in. So for me coming into Citizen Kane, I tried to temper my my feelings towards it because, you know, like you said, you know, when whenever you have the moniker of greatest of all time in any category, whether it's football player or movie or song or band, whatever, like there's a lot of weight that comes with that. So for me, I just tried to say, you know what? I'm going to come into this with an open mind. If it's great, it's great. If it's terrible, it's terrible. We'll just see what happens. Yeah, because this was the first time you'd ever seen it, right? It is hands down the first time I'd ever seen it. And I'm just going to spoil things right away. This is a great movie, Bob. It's a great movie. Like, I I don't think that there's any dispute that this is a great movie. I think everyone who actually sets aside the time to watch the movie loves the movie. And that's kind of the weird thing is that I feel like in some, like with some people that I've talked to, just having the title of greatest film of all time turns some people off from watching it because it makes them feel like this movie is homework. Like they have to watch it and it's a required thing for them. And it takes them out of wanting to enjoy the film. And so I've, I've talked to people who have avoided this movie altogether, but I don't think I've ever talked to a person who didn't enjoy the movie once they watched it. Well, it, it kind of feels like that classic critic versus common man divide, right? Like, oh, well, if the if the critics have long voted this the best movie of all time, it must be a garbage movie that only critics can appreciate. And they're probably speaking a foreign language most of the time and weird camera angles that make no sense. And the story probably is just, you know, utterly incomprehensible. And and that's like not the case at all. This is one of the most enjoyable movies I've ever watched. It, it's sad. It's emotionally charged. There, There's a lot of depth to the characters. But it's a great, incredibly watchable movie. Well, Brad, I'm so excited to hear you say that. (laughs) And just for some backstory, I knew that Brad was going into this cold, that he'd never seen it before. And like, you know, Brad can attest to this. I gave you like a laundry list of things. I was like, don't watch it when you're distracted. Turn your phone off. Make sure the subtitles are on. (laughs) Like, (laughs) Like, because I didn't want you to miss a second of this movie, because I feel like, again, because it has that sort of baggage around it, that if you watch this movie, the way you watch like reruns of The Office, I don't think you're going to get a lot out of it. Do you know what I mean? You have to fully immerse yourself in the world of the movie. And when you do that, I think it's an incredibly rewarding experience, even, you know, now 79 years on. But before we get into talking about the movie, Brad, because I have tons to talk about, you know, the history and the backstory behind the making of the film is just as exciting as the movie itself. But before we get there... I think that we have to press pause and we have to hear our favorite segment, Brad Explains, 
And this is where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he has just seen, often for the first time. And we have that today. And Brad is breaking down the plot of the movie that is arguably the greatest film ever made. So, Brad, can you walk us through a spoiler-filled review of Citizen Kane? Citizen Kane is a film about a young man named Charles Foster Kane, who at a young age is separated from his parents because they have come into a massive amount of money uh, in the form of a gold mine. And as uneducated, uh, low-income folks, they don't trust themselves to raise their son up to be able to handle this kind of money. So they sign him over to the Thatcher Bank Company, something or other, and he takes young Charles, and he kind of raises him up. He sends him off to college, and at, you know by the time he's 25, and he inherits the entire wealth of his you know vast holdings. Um, he you know he should be ready to go. Well, by the time he hits 25, he is ready to just control a newspaper, which is you know what every young 25 year old trillionaire, if it was in modern money. Uh, would be ready to do. Um, but the movie is all about him running this newspaper and his personal life. I should have started by saying the movie starts with his death. And as he dies, he utters the words Rosebud. And this newspaper, uh, I think it's a it's a magazine, is trying to figure out what these words meant so that they can better figure out who Charles Foster Kane was. And so the story of the movie is told in a series of flashbacks as they interview different people in his life who were important. Uh, his general business manager who who kept track of all of his holdings, his second wife that that left him near the end of his life, his best friend that had become estranged over the years and eventually completely stopped talking to. Um, they do all these different interviews to try to piece together who Charles Kane really was. Um, but as you look through the flashbacks, you find out that Charles Kane was a man who desperately wanted to be loved who desperately wanted to have people choose him. From the very start of the film, you see that his parents abandoned him, essentially, and he's trying to get over this hurt. And by the end of the film, he dies utterly alone by himself, utters the word Rosebud. And you find out that the word Rosebud was actually the, the company that made his sled that he was holding when his parents abandoned him as a small child. And it's really, really, really sad, Bob. Yeah, man, it, it is a really sad ending to the film because he gets everything that anyone could ever want. And what he really wants is to go back to the time where he didn't have anything because that was the last time in his life that he felt truly free, truly loved. And that word rosebud that you see on the sled, you know, it gets even worse because <laughs> they're going through his estate and in like the great hall of his mansion, they have all of his belongings laid out and it's just a labyrinth of stuff. And everyone basically gives up on finding out whatever Rosebud meant and everyone shuffles out of the building. And then the camera kind of slowly creeps down, you know, through this inventory of all of Charles Foster Kane's belongings. And it comes to rest on this old wooden sled. And you see as these like handymen are pitching stuff into the fire to be burned that they don't think is worth anything, that the camera pushes in on this burning sled and it says Rosebud. And you come to understand that this this thing was of no value to anybody except Charles Foster Kane. And yet it's the key to understanding pretty much everything about how he lived his life. It's a really, really I mean, it's a really deep movie, Brad. It says a lot about what we what we have under the surface, what we push down with our emotions, how people push others away and how you can, you know, gain everything in the world and still want something more that isn't there. Are you coming, Charles? No. I'm staying here. I can fight this all alone. Charles, if you don't listen to reason, it may be too late. Too late? For what? For you and this public thief to take the love of the people of this state away from me? Charlie, you got other things to think about. Your little boy. You don't want him to read about you in the papers. There's only one person in the world to decide what I'm going to do, and that's me. You decided what you were going to do, Charles, some time ago. And Brad, as we get into talking about the film, I think we kind of have to talk about the man behind the movie, Orson Welles, because he is involved in every single aspect of the production of this film. His story is incredible. 
Yeah, Bob, I, I, I'll be honest with you. Other than the fact that Orson Welles, A, was in Citizen Kane, and B, did the War of the Worlds broadcast, I, I didn't really know much about him. You know, I'd always been a little bit fascinated, you know, especially with the War of the Worlds broadcast. But the the only thing I really knew was that, like, this he, he put out this radio broadcast and he had this compelling voice. And it was supposed to be one of those, like, radio stories that you hear. But everybody was, like, utterly convinced that aliens were actually invading America and that there was mass chaos happening and and people lost their mind. Like, it's 2020 and we're losing our mind right now. But just think, like, what would happen if somebody got on the news and said there are aliens invading Earth? And everybody was like, oh, I guess, you know, he said it, so we have to believe it. <laughs> like, that was just a crazy time, man. But other than that, I I didn't really know much about Orson Welles. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that he is the most famous for. He grew up kind of a boy wonder. You know, I, I think back to when we watched, like, Amadeus and they talk about how he was playing piano at four years old. Orson Welles was kind of like that. His childhood is kind of the stuff of legend because Wells liked to tell tall tales about the people that he met. We knew that he kind of ran around with Harry Houdini for a little while as a little boy. He was a showman. And, you know, it, he's this this genius of a kid. He eventually moves into radio and theater and he's doing radio broadcasts like the War of the Worlds in 1938. And he starts a theater troupe in New York called the Mercury Theater Group. And they become like one of the hottest tickets in town. Super revolutionary theater stuff. And the more buzz that he's generating in New York, the more Hollywood wants to get him on board. And so RKO, the studio that finally got Wells on board, they offered him what was essentially an unprecedented contract at that time. They said, come to RKO, make two movies for us. And what we're going to do in the meantime is we are going to give you complete artistic control of these two movies. As long as we can approve the stories and as long as you don't go over budget. They gave him free reign. He actually, in his contract, it said that uh, RKO executives wouldn't even be allowed to see footage from the movie unless he approved it as he was making it. So essentially, he was our first, like, Stanley Kubrick, you know, insane control type director. Yeah, in a sense, at least, you know, in the Hollywood studio system, nobody had ever been really granted the privilege of what's called Final Cut. Final Cut is like, I get to determine what the final edit of this movie looks like, and the studio cannot make any further edits without my approval. They were really banking on this kid doing something revolutionary, and obviously he did, but people around Hollywood were so resentful of this contract because it was given to this guy who had never made a movie before, who flew out to California when he was 24 years old, and now is making his own movie. He's writing it, he's directing it, he's starring in it. It's, it's an insane story. This movie came out when Orson Welles was 26 years old. Brad, you and I are both older than that. What have we ever done with our lives that, <laughs> that is like anywhere remotely close to this? It is insane when you think about what he produced as such a young man and with absolutely no background in film whatsoever. Well, I, I think you might be selling the Film and Whiskey podcast a little short, Bob. <laughs> uh, we, we clearly have put something of great value here on this earth, but... But Bob Orson, yeah, Orson Welles, you know, I don't know tons about him other than the words you just said to me, but I'll tell you what, the dude is a phenomenal actor. I came into this movie just kind of being like, yeah, you know, he wrote and directed it. And so I guess he got to choose to star in it, kind of like Tommy Wiseau in the room. <laughs> but uh, it turns out the, the dude's got some chops. Oh, my gosh. He has incredible chops. It's one of the greatest performances in screen history. And you watch him age from basically what, like 20, 21 years old to mid 70s, probably. And what they were doing to age him on screen was even revolutionary. The makeup effects for this movie are out of this world. Like, it's been 80 years, and I think most of the makeup in this movie holds up really, really well. Uh, they actually used 72 different face pieces to age Orson Welles over the course of this film. And the fun fact is, including 16 different chins that he wore. But what, what blows my mind is how well he's actually able to sell his aging. Like, he plays a 50-year-old man really convincingly. He plays a 70-year-old man really convincingly. And I think actually pretty uniformly across the cast, they don't lean into like, well, I'm an old man now. Like, they all sell it pretty convincingly. But you're right, Brad. Wells is spearheading that whole thing, and his performance is mind-blowing. 
And I will say, Bob, I, I'm I'm going to start with a, a little bit of tapering off. I do think this is a spectacular movie, and I, I think it does deserve being in the topic of greatest movie of all time. But I will say, as you're watching this movie, there's definitely some issues. Um, there's certain actors that I don't think were very good. Uh, there's certain lines of the script that are just just kind of silly or frustrating or whatever. You know, and so I, I guess I'm just going to kind of pull back a little bit on the praise to say, I like, I love this movie, but I, I, I can understand why somebody would watch this and go, yeah, that was great, but greatest film of all time. Sure. Well, can you give an example, Brad? Like, what do you think hasn't aged well or, or maybe a performance that you didn't think was particularly great? Yeah, I, I guess I'll start with just a few lines that I, that I, that I just thought was rough. Um, the His mother and father were two of the cheesiest performances I've ever seen oh, in my life. See, I thought his mom was especially great. Agnes Moorhead went on to have a really long film and TV career. Um, and I thought she played that, like, cold, calculating, I have decided what I'm going to do really, really well. Oh, I, <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was so terrible. Dude. Oh, man. Like the the line where the dad goes, well, well, you know what this kid needs is a good thrashing. And she goes, is that what you think? And he goes, <laughs> well, yes. And she goes, that's why he is going to be brought up where you can't get to him. <laughs> and I'm like, I get that you're getting rid of your son and you're trying to put on a brave face. And so, like, I can kind of understand the motivation behind this cold facade. But, like, it was so robotic. <laughs> and the dad was so over the top. Like, I thought that it was Walter Houston on screen looking dead into the camera for a second. His dad was so bad. <laughs> and granted, like, I am what, Bob, I'm 100% okay with the fact that I'm nitpicking right oh, yeah. now. That's one very small scene. It's an important scene because it establishes the character and it's really what the whole movie revolves around. So maybe I'm not nitpicking, but it is a short scene. I, you know, just little things like that. But one performance that I actually disliked throughout the entire film was Joseph Cotton as I Jedediah knew you were I knew I, you were going to say that. Well, why did you know that I was going to say that? I Bob? think, yeah, well, I don't know. I just, as I'm watching the movie, I do think that Joseph Cotton like leans a little bit into, like I said, most of the actors don't do the, hey, I'm a sassy old man, but Joseph Cotton <laughs> really leans into that hard. So now young man gets me a cigar, but have him, have him set it up as a, <laughs> as a stick of toothpaste. So I will say, okay, I think that, okay, Jedediah. I think young Jed Leland is really good, even like to the point where you know, he gets drunk and writes the bad review and then Kane fires him. I think he's great. Old man Jed, I'll I'll totally give that to you. <laughs> uh, Joseph Cotton, though, fantastic actor. We will watch more movies with him in it uh, as we go in the podcast. But I will give you that. I will concede that point to you, Brad, <laughs> that old man Jed Leland, a little tacky. All right. And the last the last one, and th this one just made me laugh. But when uh, Thatcher... Uh, is is reading the note from Kane saying that he wants to run a newspaper. He writes to him and says, I think it would be fun to run a newspaper. And like <gasps> Thatcher repeats oh, yeah. the line and he goes, oh, I think it will be fun to write a newspaper. And then he like growls at the camera. He looks, he, he, he goes, breaks the fourth wall. Yeah, I noticed he it. He breaks the fourth wall and he goes, Argh. Well, and then there's like a whole <laughs> montage of Kane doing this for years and years to him in his paper, like um, immediately yeah. after that. And he looks at the camera like, I don't know, three out of the time. five times. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So like, that's it. Those are my nitpicks that like, it's really not much more than that. But th those are a few things that I was like, okay, yeah. this, is, this is a little <laughs> bit cheesy. I can I can get down with that. Like, I, I understand. I do want to talk a little bit about the writing in this movie because Wells wrote the screenplay with Herman Mankiewicz. And this is actually one of the most controversial scripts of all time because there was a dispute for a long time over who really wrote the movie. And what we know now is that basically what happened was Wells had – an idea for a movie about a guy who had died and people told his story like in a nonlinear way. And you only found out about this person through the flashbacks of other people. And Mankiewicz had been wanting to write a movie where he really dug into William Randolph Hearst because he had a personal history with Hearst. He was, you know, kind of a socialite. He was a writer and he was known for his wit. He hung out with Hearst at his house for a long time. And eventually his drinking got so bad and his political views got so 
he was so upfront about his political views that Hearst basically banned him from ever coming back to his house and cut him off completely. And so then Mankiewicz hated Hearst and wanted to get at him as much as he could. And so they basically combined their talents to make this a movie about the newspaper tycoon William Randolph Hearst in a roundabout way. And so uh, they figured out what the characters were going to be like, what the story arc was going to be like. They each went off and basically wrote a separate draft of the screenplay. And then Wells took both of their drafts and kind of condensed them and combined them into what became Citizen Kane. Over the years, Mankiewicz got like just really, really pissy about it, uh, continued to assert that like he was the sole author and that Wells didn't do anything. And it was a big hubbub. But aside from all of the authorship stuff, this screenplay was like a nuclear bomb in Hollywood. You know, they really had to keep it under wraps. And it wasn't until the movie was finished and people started seeing it for the first time that they found out, oh, the subject matter of this story is really, really salacious. And Hearst is going to be really pissed about this. And he was. And we'll get into talking about the fallout of the movie later on. But, Brad, I mean, it's it's not often that you see a movie take down a public figure while that person is still alive and in such a pointed way as this movie does. Bob, this script is just utterly spectacular beyond the fact that it weaves this intricate narrative that slowly reveals the depths of, you know, Charles Kane's hurt and how it has twisted him into this bitter old man. Like beyond all of that, there's just some great lines in this movie. You know, you ha you have Kane talking about how he always gagged on the silver spoon and you have his manager talking about, you know, oh, ma making money is easy. Like the only thing it takes to make a lot of money is to want to make a lot of money. You know, you have to look deeper than that to really understand Charles Kane. Like th like there's just so many great lines in this movie. We could literally probably make a podcast just talking about Citizen Kane, and that podcast could probably last, I don't know, 20, 30 episodes? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things, Brad, that, that struck me watching this movie, you know, and this is probably the 15th time I've seen this movie all the way through. What struck me this time, having watched so many other classic films already for this podcast, is just how ahead of its time this movie was in, in almost every facet. Like, it's kind of mind-blowing. And I think I told you before we went into watching it, I said, like, don't expect Casablanca. Don't expect the Hollywood look. Don't expect typical camera movements. There's something about this movie that feels kind of like European. And we haven't really watched any foreign films on this podcast yet. But it just has this vibe that is just, it's so different from what was coming out of Hollywood at the time. And it's the camera angles. It's the overlapping dialogue. It's the way that they cut between scenes. You know, what really what I really, really loved about this movie was the editing. You have Kane dying at the beginning after this weird trippy montage of him saying Rosebud and dropping the uh, the snow globe and it fades out and then it immediately cuts back in on this newsreel. And you spend like, I don't know, seven minutes, eight minutes of the movie watching an old timey newsreel. And it isn't until the newsreel is done that you find out you were watching this thing that was being produced by the magazine where we're going to get the journalist who's going to try to track down what Rosebud meant. It's really, really uh, complex in how they piece this narrative together. And they're in this little screening room and the journalist is like, well, I don't know what Rosebud means. And his boss is like, well, we're going to send you on the road to find out what Rosebud means. And the last thing he says to him is Rosebud, dead or alive. And then he just goes, you know, it'll probably turn out to be a very simple thing. And there's an immediate crash of lightning and thunder and that's how we get to the next scene and it's the kind of thing you'd see in a movie now but in 1941 they didn't do scene transitions like that they did these long slow dissolves between scenes or fade outs this movie's like no no we need to move this thing along and we're gonna do things in ways that you've never seen before and i was just really really struck at how parts of this movie were like 30 years ahead of its time if not more honestly the the only other director that I feel like really compares to this film is Alfred Hitchcock. Hmm. Like when I think about another director that really just advanced film as a whole, I think about Hitchcock. And, and when I think about Hitchcock's movies, some of the cinematography from Hitchcock, I have to believe was directly inspired by Orson Welles in Citizen Kane. 
Like there's so many shots of the characters in unique manners. Like I'm thinking of when you see Orson Welles walking down the hallway after his wife leaves him and, and you get him walking in front of these mirrors and you just see infinite reflections of himself. Like those types of shots are unique and fascinating and visionary. And I feel like those are the types of things you get from Hitchcock. I think it's a really great point, and it's going to get me into a conversation about the cinematography in this movie, which I don't know if we'll be able to finish before we get to our break. But the cinematographer, Greg Toland, was one of the biggest names in Hollywood. He actually uh, worked for a different studio and came over to RKO to tell Wells, I want to work for you on this movie. And the reason that he did that was because he figured that somebody that was as ambitious as Wells and with as little experience as Wells, would probably give him the freedom to do really innovative and new things that he'd never been allowed to do before. And he was right. Wells didn't really know what he was doing. Uh, he sat down with Greg Toland and watched a bunch of movies to figure out, like, how to direct. And he let Toland kind of, you know, run amok. They were doing things with the camera that nobody had done before. Really famously, they, they cut a hole out of the concrete floor of the soundstage and put the camera underground so that they could look up at two characters as they walked around. These these low angle shots where you saw the ceilings uh, in the sound stages. The sets back then didn't usually have ceilings. And and Wells wanted to show, no, no, we're not going to take any tricks. We're not going to cut any corners. We want to show you, you, we want you to be fully immersed in this movie. And you see it in some of the shots where um, Toland used deep focus, which means that like you could have a person six inches away from the camera And then another person that walks to the other end of the room, you know, 100 feet away, and they are both in perfect focus. And one of the really cool things about that, aside from just looking awesome, is that it kind of makes you as a viewer have to piece together what you're seeing visually. You know, usually with movies, they put something in focus because they want you to see it. They put other things out of focus because they're not supposed to be important to you. In this movie, Wells is not like holding your hand. He's not telling you what's important and what's not. You have to take in the whole image and you have to try to piece together. What do I need to learn about this guy to figure out what Rosebud is? And I think it really adds to the mystery of it all. And he does it in in really subtle ways like that. When you have a shot like that, it's forcing the viewer to make a choice because, you know, I can only take in one thing at a time. And so my eyes have to choose. Am I going to pay attention to Kane in the far background or to his wife doing a jigsaw puzzle right by the fire? Like, you you have to choose where you want to look. And like you said, there's no hand-holding going on here. It, the, the cinematography is just so cool. Now, there's a few moments where, I, I can't remember exactly where it is, where, like, you get kind of an awkward zoom in, or you, you get a, a fade-out that just kind of feels a little strange. I, I remember a few moments where I was like, okay, this is older cinema like the the way that they zoomed was much different honestly it's a lot faster than they do it today so there's still a few moments that haven't like aged perfectly but overall this movie like you said it advanced the science of cinematography so far that it it just can't be understated well brad i think this is a really good place for us to hit pause we need to get into talking about one of our favorite bourbons from way back when Eagle Rare. Uh, But we're going to pick it up right after that and get into talking about a little bit more of the backstory and what we appreciate about Citizen Kane. So what do you say we try this Eagle Rare? Let's get to it. So today we are checking out Eagle Rare. This is a whiskey that is near and dear to our hearts. I think on the podcast we've mentioned before that my first bourbon, or the one that really got me into bourbon, uh, was Woodford Double Oaked, which we still haven't done. We'll do someday. But the one that I picked up at the liquor store for myself that I was like, that looks interesting. That's something that I think I'm ready to take a step up from bottom shelf. The first one, and Brad, we actually split the cost of it. You and I went to the liquor store. When we were living in Kentucky and we bought a bottle of Eagle Rare. And I think that was one of the first ones where we were like, wow, 
I can I can tell what's going on here. I can tell why people love drinking bourbon so much. And I, I have to say, I haven't really revisited Eagle Rare in a long time. It's one that a lot of people respect, but not a lot of people talk about. I don't see people constantly posting, you know, in the, in the bourbon social media world about Eagle Rare. So I'm pretty excited to revisit it and see what we think of it after drinking so many whiskeys together. Yeah, Bob, you're uh, you're hitting me in all the feels right now. I, <laughs> I I very clearly remember going to that liquor store, buying that Eagle Rare, and you know trying it at my apartment. Like that was such a great experience. And I won't lie to you, I think I might murder somebody for some Eagle Rare 17 year. It's that hard to get. I really want to try it. Uh, and they actually so Eagle Rare 17 is the next step up from what we're drinking today. What we're drinking today is called Eagle Rare 10 year. For a long time, it had the uh, distinction of single barrel. They no longer put that on the bottle, but I'm told that it still is a single barrel bourbon. So there may be some variety across what you're drinking. If you pick up a bottle at your local liquor store, it might taste a little bit different than what Brad and I are drinking today. Uh, but the next step up is called Eagle Rare 17, and it is part of the BTAC collection, uh, which is from Buffalo Trace. It is a really, really high end uh, annual anniversary collection they put out every year, and you know, it probably retails for about two fifty, and it probably sells on the secondary market for like a thousand dollars. It is almost impossible to get. And then they actually have one that's above that called Double Eagle, very rare, which I have seen <laughs> selling for upwards of ten thousand dollars. And that thing is <laughs> insane. Like just the packaging of it is crazy. If you want to, if you want to have a good laugh, go to Google and look at Double Eagle, very rare, uh, because we will never be having that on this podcast unless something miraculous happens unless a charles kane type figure takes pity on our small <laughs> small podcast. yeah exactly so brad we have <laughs> we've poured out this eagle rare 10 year let's jump into it let's revisit this together man what are you picking up on the nose here bob i this is it's a subtle nose it's it's not super upfront and in your face but it, it's nice and sweet and it's got a little bit of citrus in there mm-hmm. i i don't know if it's like orangey or not but there there's a little bit of freshness that goes along with some of those classic vanilla e bourbon notes. What, what are you getting? So I've tried this out of three different glasses now. And I have to say, like, the, the first two, I, I had it out of a Glencairn and I had it out of my, like, kind of angular glass that I like to drink out of. I was underwhelmed both times. And I was like, man, I don't want to go into this review and give Eagle Rare a bad score. So I just poured it into a, a rocks glass, an old fashioned glass. And I, I like it a lot more out of this, Brad. I'm getting uh, just like your basic bourbon notes, a little bit of caramel, lots of black pepper. This has a very spicy nose. Uh, there's some oak and some ethanol. And then that that fruity note, I'm I'm getting it more as a green apple than I am as an orange, but it's definitely present. I will say, though, that like this is not the kind of nose that's going to knock you out, like with with how amazingly aromatic it is. It's pretty standard. It smells like it, it might pack a little bit of a punch. Uh, given how much spice and how much ethanol I'm getting. But I, I can't say that I'm really like blown away with this nose, Brad. Yeah, it, it's a solid nose. Uh, it's giving me what I want. It's intriguing me, but it's not taking me down a path where I'm like, you know, greatest bourbon of all time. So I'm going to give it a seven and a half on the nose. Yeah, I think I'm going to give it a six and a half on the nose. Um, it, You know, it's above average, but it's really not blowing me away. Again, it is only 90 proof, so that might have something to do with it but we'll find out for sure when we take a sip. Oh, Bob, I I love this whiskey, man. I think as I as I get into the palate on this, it has a little bit of oakiness up front. Um it it's not incredibly sweet, but it's just a nice pleasant bit of vanilla, of brown sugar that kind of matches that oakiness. And then, honestly, it's a little bit more on the finish where I feel like I get some of that citrus coming back in uh, that I found on the nose. Um, it's a really pleasant, not overwhelming palette that I, I think is really solid. I'm going to stick it a seven and a half. I'm really surprised at, at how different the flavor profile is on this out of three different glasses. You know, and, and that's kind of to be expected, but I'm getting a little bit sour up front, actually, which I wasn't expecting. This is usually a pretty thin whiskey that's, you know, vaguely sweet. And I got that out of the first two glasses. But this one, I'm picking up a lot of that citrus that Brad's talking about. I get a little bit of like a lemony flavor and maybe some grapefruit, almost like a bitter uh, citrus flavor. There is a, a touch of like a a caramel, but it almost has like a little bit of a saline taste to it, Brad. Like a 
salted caramel kind of flavor. Yeah. And then there's just that pepper and oak that we had on the nose. It's, I mean, it checks almost every box. But what I really don't like about it is that it doesn't really lean in any one direction. It's not really a sweet whiskey. It's not really a spicy whiskey. It's not really like a sour, ethanol-heavy whiskey. I don't know if that means that it's really well balanced or if it just kind of does a lot of things to a mediocre level. So I'm actually only going to give this a six on the taste. Man, Bob, I, I think we're going to end up in pretty different places on this, if I'm if I'm being honest. Because when I get to the finish, I think the finish is where this whiskey kind of struggles a little bit. The, there's definitely a movement from that nice balance of flavors to I, I'm just getting a little bit of oak and a little bit of citrus, but but it doesn't last very long. It's just a decent finish. I'm going to give it a six and a half. Yeah, it's definitely an oak heavy finish. There's not really much of a Kentucky hug. Again, this is only 90 proof, but the alcohol is present. I will say, though, that what I like about this is that it tastes like a higher proof whiskey than it is, if that makes sense. Like the level of oak that they're extracting from this, because it's 10 years old, it suggests that you, I mean, like I would think this was 100 proof if you just put it in front of me, but it's only 90 proof. And I like the fact that, you know, it's not burning my chest on the way down. It is a kind of a shorter finish, but I like it. I'll give it a six and a half on the finish. And that brings us to overall balance. Honestly, Bob, I actually think this is an extremely well-balanced whiskey. It doesn't overpower you with any specific flavor, and there's not any one specific part that is like way better or way worse than the others. I think this is a solidly balanced whiskey that has a lot to offer. I'm going to give it an eight out of 10 on balance. So sometimes on this podcast, we talk about how we can't tell if it's really well balanced or if um, there's just really nothing great about it. And I think I'm kind of leaning towards the latter, where, Brad, it sounds like you're leaning towards the former. This is not bad, but it's not great either in terms of how it's balanced. Like I said, I think it punches above its weight class a little bit. It, it drinks like 100 proof, even though it's only 90 proof. And I think there's something to be said about that. But that is mostly because of the age statement more than anything else. I like this. I think it's pretty well balanced, but there's no part of this that's really like knocking my socks off. So I'm going to give it a six and a half on balance. And our, our final category, as always, is value. Where does this whiskey stand when you look at, you know, the vast array of whiskeys out there? As far as price goes, you can get a fifth of Eagle Rare in the state of Ohio for thirty one ninety nine. Which I have to interrupt you there and just say, like, this is a hard to find whiskey. Like, it, it's kind of like Buffalo Trace's flagship bourbon in that way, where that's marked at like $25 retail and you can never find it anywhere. Eagle Rare is the same way. We may be able to get it for $31 in the state of Ohio, but that means that A, you actually found a store that has it in stock. And B, you live in a state like Ohio where it's price controlled. Because on the secondary market, I've seen Eagle Rare selling for like $90 before. So, you know, we give our score based on what we can get on the shelf in the state of Ohio. I understand that not a lot of our listeners are going to be able to get this for $32. Uh, but for $32, Brad, I think this is a really good value. Like I said, it, it punches above its weight class in terms of what it's delivering uh, in the like the oakiness, the aged flavors that you get. Is it my favorite whiskey at the price point? Probably not. But if you can get this at $32... I think this is a pretty high value. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 on value. I was literally about to give it the same score, Bob. I, I think that for $32, this is one of the more unique whiskeys you can get. I also think that this is a great introductory whiskey. Like if you have a, a friend who is newer to the whiskey world, wants to try a good bourbon, pour this out for them. It has so many things going on. It's slightly complex, but not way beyond something a beginner would want to try. You know, I, I highly recommend this whiskey. I think $31, $32 is a great price point for it. So I, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 on value. And that brings my final score to a 37.5 out of 50. That brings me to a 33 and a half, which takes our average to a 35.5 out of 50 or a 71 out of 100. I think that's a pretty good place for this, Brad. I have a soft spot in my heart for Eagle Rare. And even though I think that I found a lot of bourbons that I like more than this, I will keep coming back to this because, you know, this this is our history together, man. This is like one of the first ones we ever tried. And I think sometimes you just have to have that whiskey on the shelf that makes you feel a little sentimental. 
Yeah, I mean, what would be the point of life if you didn't have great memories to look back on? I'm pretty sure this is this is our rosebud, right? The, I, I was about to say, Bob, this might be our rosebud. Wow. I'm going to be on my deathbed. <laughs> With a bottle of Eagle Rare. the words, <laughs> Eagle Rare. And, and all the newspapers are going to be like, what did Brad mean? <laughs> oh, man, Bob, let's let's get back into talking about Citizen Kane. Let's get to it. Right, everybody, that was Eagle Rare Ten Year, a whiskey that has deep nostalgic roots for us and overall is an above average solid whiskey. But now we're back here talking about Orson Welles' absolute masterpiece of a film, Citizen Kane. And Bob, I, I think one of the things that intrigued me most about this movie is the way the story was told. Like when when you look at the way this script is structured, You see this reporter, which, you know, this is just an aside. I love that the reporter didn't really matter in the movie. I love that he was just kind of a prop to go from person to person. But but the key of this movie was the fact that this reporter goes to these important people in Kane's life and asks them, like, hey, what did what did Rosebud mean? Did he did he ever talk to you about it? And all of them basically go, No, he never talked about Rosebud, but let me tell you about this one time. Right, right. And you just kind of fade into this flashback. My favorite uh, transition in the movie is when you go from Jedediah Leland being fired from the newspaper back to the present where the reporter is interviewing him. And you have the scene in the top right corner, which ends up being a shadow in the in the modern current scene. It's just awesome. Hello, Jedediah. Hello, Charlie. I didn't know we were speaking. Sure, we're speaking, Jedediah. You're fired. Yeah, Brad. And and the thing is, like, as we talk about this movie, I feel like it's really hard to talk about just the cinematography or just the direction or just the story structure because they all bleed into each other. This is one of the first movies that ever really dealt with a non-linear story. And we're so used to seeing it now that it's really hard to put yourself in a position of people watching this movie in 1941. But I was just reading an article today uh, from a really famous silent director called Eric von Stroheim. And he was talking about how he didn't understand this movie. Like he didn't like Citizen Kane because he couldn't get into it. He watched the first 20 minutes and was asking people, what is this movie about? I don't understand what's going on. Because you'd never had movies that were just basically, hey, I'm going to go talk to this person and learn a piece about his life. And then I'm going to go talk to this person and learn about a piece of his life. The movie really is structured like a jigsaw puzzle. Like it becomes a really huge theme in the second part of the movie. And you're piecing together parts of this man's life and trying to make something out of it. And at the end of the film, what you find out is that, no, none of that stuff really mattered. What really mattered was that he desperately wanted to get out of the situation that he was in. And I think it's really beautiful how you get just kind of fragments of his life and how Wells and the cinematographer, Greg Toland, kind of lean into that. Like you said, when you're coming out of a dream or a memory, you'll have like the young version of that person on one side of the screen while they're fading up the old version of the person on the other side of the screen. And it's this really, really profound kind of transition from young, young man to old man. This really is a movie about time and about regret and longing for days past and nostalgia. And I think that they really effectively convey that visually and with the way the story is structured. Well, and I I will say, Bob, I know I said I was done nitpicking earlier, but I wasn't totally sure if I liked the way this movie started. It's just too abstract. You, Hmm. You get him muttering the word rosebud, rosebud, and like. 
it's this like severe shot of the K in the great, you know, of the gate leading into Xanadu. And it's this like almost Transylvanian vampire-esque castle. And, it, you know, you see him dying and this thing shatters and it's so foreign that I'm like, oh, man, is this what we're in for? Like, this movie mm. is weird. And then it gets into the newsreel. And and I will say, I kind of agree with the silent film director. Until we actually got to the newspapermen talking about what they were going to write a story about, until we got to there, I was like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. Like, the, the newsreel just didn't really work for me. He's talking about a made-up place. I was really thrown for a loop. And, you know, so for me, the start of the movie is actually when the newspapermen start talking about Rosebud and those were his final words and we need to go back and figure out what those meant. Like, for me, that's the start of the movie. And I know that the the newsreel accomplishes a lot of exposition, but I would honestly be curious if, for a first-time viewing, you started the movie with them talking about it. I, I, I'm curious if it would be for a better movie-going experience. I think that's a really good point, because... It's a huge gamble to do what he did with the beginning of this film. You get this really, like you said, abstract kind of almost like a montage of of Kane dying. And then it cuts right to this newsreel and you're just forced to sit there and watch it. And it's not until you get the context after the fact that like, oh, this is actually a movie about newspaper men that that it all starts to kind of make sense. And you watched him die and then you watch the story of his life. And it's kind of ballsy for him to have done it the way that he... I mean, I have to give him props for starting his movie that way because it is so foreign to what people were doing in film at that time. And I think even still today, if you started a movie like that, people would be disoriented. I will say, though, that I think once you get to the end of the movie and you've kind of pieced it all together and you look back and you say, what was the function of that whole thing? I think that the newsreel serves a really important purpose because it really takes any sort of tension or suspense out of the movie in terms of like finding out that he died or finding out like the major broad strokes of his life. You get the whole story of Charles Foster Kane's life right there in those first 10 minutes of the film. And what you watch after that is everyone's recollection of how it happened. And I think it's really cool to see it from different perspectives because small things seem a little bit different or you get more context around them. And I think as the viewer, it helps you not get bogged down in the details of his life because you've seen it all already. And you're like, oh, this is when this thing happens. This is when he starts cheating on his wife. This is how, you know, he builds an opera house for his wife who isn't really talented. And when you start to get those like the the context and start to kind of fill in the gaps a little bit, it helps the puzzle kind of come together a little bit more. And I think you're right. Like, it's really it's disorienting. It's hard to get behind. But if you push through the first 10 minutes, I think it makes a lot of sense why he did it that way. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Bob. There, there's a lot of beauty to that sequence in regards to the whole film. But it's it's tough to get behind when that's the first thing you see. Oh, for sure. I do think it's really cool. Like the story behind that newsreel is like he actually handed it off to RKO's newsroom, like newsreel division to edit them because he said they edit it and they edit things in such a kooky way. That, like, we couldn't reproduce it, so we wanted them to edit it. And when they got the film back, like, the, the editor, Robert Wise, who went on to be a very famous director, all of the footage that was supposed to be from the 1920s or earlier, he wanted to make it look like old film stock. And so he took the film and he ran it through cheesecloth that was, like, that had sand inside of it to scratch it up and make it look like old, deteriorating, silent film. Like, when I think of the the little touches that Wells put into this movie... It just seems like he was so much more prepared. He was so much more organized. He had such a unique vision of what he wanted to do. And it just totally went against what the studios in Hollywood were doing at the time, which is we're going to crank out 50 movies a year. Hello. We work in the most efficient way possible. Yeah, well, I, I think what you're looking at, Bob, is the the idea that consumers do desire quality. And I think that this is a struggle that filmmakers have had with the American public, you know, since they started making films, because I still think that the American public just wants flashy, crazy, cool, you know, CGI stuff in the modern era. But in the end, this is a sign that like, no, like 
things that are artistic, things that advance the art form are also things that can be generally accessible to the public. And I think it's important that we don't lambast Citizen Kane for being, quote unquote, the greatest movie of all time, you know, as an art critic film study type of movie. And I think it's worth just sitting down and going, yeah, let's just let's just have a beer and watch a movie and and see what we think of it. And and it's also one of those movies that not only can you just sit down and appreciate the movie for what it is, the story behind the movie itself is just crazy. You know, we've already do- dove into Orson Welles as a boy wonder. But I, to me, the most fascinating part of this story is that I, I would call this movie a fictional biopic where they basically take the life of William Randolph Hearst, turn it into a movie, and there was a lot of trouble that happened because of that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the only thing that I can really think that compares to it, I know, you know, a few years ago, Oliver Stone made a movie about George W. Bush, but that didn't really catch on with the public. Like, this reminds me a lot of what we saw with The Social Network. And I remember after The Social Network came out, Saturday Night Live had Jesse Eisenberg hosting it, and they actually had Mark Zuckerberg come at the end of his monologue and just kind of stand there awkwardly and say, like, yep, I've seen the movie. (laughs) And, And it's like... It was a very awkward moment. And I think about what this must have been like for Hearst, because some of the details in this movie were based on some really, really heavy gossip about his life. And it got to the point where, like, Hearst was fighting as hard as he possibly could. This man controlled an empire of newspapers and media across the country, refused to advertise for this film at all. For a while, you know, he basically shut down all advertisement for RKO to try to send a message. When this movie was first screened for critics, uh, this gossip columnist who was very famous called Hedda Hopper, she saw the movie uh, and her arch rival was Luella Parsons, who worked for Hearst. And so she leveraged this into like basically crapping on Luella Parsons because she sent a message to Hearst like, I saw this movie. You're not going to like what's in it. And so Hearst went to his person, Parsons, and was like, why haven't you seen this movie? Why haven't you warned me about the fact that they're making this fictionalized, sensationalized version of my life. And so Luella Parsons like went on a crusade. She went to the head of the studio at RKO and basically threatened lawsuits. She threatened to expose people on the payroll that were like having affairs that they knew about. Then she went to the heads of the other studios and said, if you guys let this movie get out, we will publish all of all of the dirt we have on everybody in Hollywood, basically. And it got to the point where there was so much pressure That uh, MGM, which was headed by Louis B. Mayer, they sent a person to RKO basically to offer to buy the negative for this movie for a million dollars to cover the cost of the production and burn it and never release it. And eventually, you know, they they released the movie. They did not cave to the pressure. But Hearst was successful in convincing many, many, many theaters to not show the movie. And so it had a really small, limited theatrical run. It got kicked out of uh, Radio City Music Hall, which was the place it was supposed to premiere. It had to go to a different theater. Wells said that when he went to the Chicago premiere, the theater was almost empty. And so it, it made some money. Like, I think it lost a little bit of money on its budget, but it was the sixth or seventh highest grossing movie of the year. But the backlash was so heavy uh, that it even affected the movie's Oscar chances. And it was nominated for, I think, nine Oscars. It won one Oscar for Best Screenplay. Didn't win for Best Actor for Orson Welles. It didn't win Best Picture. And it, it's become one of those stories in Hollywood history about how, you know, when you get the wrong person against you, it can really tank your chances. Eventually, Orson Welles' contract with RKO kind of lapsed. They renegotiated the contract. He never had the artistic control that he had on this movie again. He was really never able to fundraise to the extent that he did for this movie again. And if you know the story about Orson Welles' life, I mean, he he gets poorer and poorer. He's trying to scrape together money to make movies, and he never really gets it. He ends up kind of in the 70s. He's like this overweight guy who's doing commercials for, you know, boxed wines and stuff to try to make ends meet. It's a really sad story in a way because we look at this movie as the greatest film of all time and as well as this artistic genius. And he made some great movies after this, but he never had the power in Hollywood after this movie. And in some ways, it kind of seems like Hearst got the last laugh. Well, the fascinating thing to me, Bob, is the fact that as I was watching this movie, it felt like Orson Welles wrote the character of Charles Kane partially after himself. 
You know, he writes him as this young, ambitious, intelligent man that is going to take over the world. Mm. And by the end of the movie, he's literally lost everything in an attempt to make people love him. And from what you've just told me about the way Orson Welles' life kind of went, it, it doesn't seem like it's totally dissimilar to the life of Charles Kane. And, and that's just honestly, Bob, honestly, I'm a little bit sad right now. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could spin that in a more positive way, but it, it's it's this really interesting story of two men at odds and, and both of their wills being imposed on each other. And I guess if there is a silver lining, it's that we get this movie out of it. And Brad, I really do think that despite all the backlash that we've heard over the years of people saying, like, it's not the greatest movie of all time, I'm sick of people saying that, it really does have a claim to be the greatest film of all time. And I think, you know, for a movie to be in that conversation, it's got to be one of those movies that when someone at least mentions it as a possible, like, as a possibility, you go, okay, I can see that. And there's really only a few movies in that company. I mean, it's like... This movie, Casablanca, The Godfather, you know, 2001, and, and a couple others. This is in that upper echelon of films, and I think it's there for good reason. And I really want to hear, Brad, your final thoughts and your final score on Citizen Kane. Well, going into this, I I really was struggling with a final score because I... You know, when you have this greatest film of all time moniker attached to it, it's easy to say, well, I'm going to give it a nine and a half, you know, because it's not the greatest film of all time. And, you know, I had this and this and this that I didn't like about it. Uh, but I, honestly, Bob, the more I think about it, one of the big factors for me is rewatchability. And like this isn't a movie I'm going to watch 40 times in my life. But I could easily see myself watching it three or four more times in my lifetime and loving it every single time. You know, it's something that I want to share with my friends. It's something that I want to sit down with my child someday when they're, I don't know, 17, 18, 19, 20, and watch this with them and, and hope that they appreciate it for, for how amazing it is. Bob, it's a 10 out of 10 for me. There's so much greatness going on in this movie. And yes, there's nitpicks. Yes, there's parts that I don't care for. You know, for me, 10 out of 10 doesn't mean perfect movie because then I would never give a 10 out of 10. Absolutely. For me, You know what I mean? Like for me, a 10 out of 10 is a movie that I just go, man, I was enthralled. I was absolutely entranced by the story that was happening on screen. And I can't imagine cinema being where it would be without this movie. And for, yeah. and for me, Citizen Kane checks all of those boxes. And so it, it's a 10 out of 10 for me. Brad, I think on the very first episode we ever did, which was Goodfellas, we got to the end of that episode more and like, I was like... More like bad fellas, am I right? I was like, do I think this is a perfect movie? No, but I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10. And at that time, you gave me some pushback. You were like, how can you... not? How can you say it's not a perfect movie and give it a 10 out of 10? And I think that the more I watch movies, the more I realize I don't think there is such a thing as a perfect movie. Yep. I don't know if there's a movie that I wouldn't change one tiny thing about or that I can't nitpick. And so when you when you put this movie up there as greatest of all time, I don't know that we're saying that makes it a perfect movie. Is this my personal greatest film ever? I don't know. I think the more movies I watch now, the more I'm like, I don't think I ever really want to pick one movie to put on a pedestal above all other movies. It's certainly one of the best films I've ever seen. And I'm, I'm fine leaving it at that. What I want people to do, though, is to check the movie out, to not think of it as a homework assignment, to not think of it as like this cold, distant thing that they can't enjoy or interact with. This is an intensely watchable movie. Like, it's it's really entertaining. It's not a boring film, and it holds up 80 years later. I 100% recommend Citizen Kane, and I'm absolutely going to give it a 10 out of 10, which means that this is, I think, the first film of this season, Brad, that we have both given 10s to, and I think that it is a very fitting movie for us to do that with. Now, I will say, Bob... Here at the Film and Whiskey podcast, we have a bracket and we decide what the best movie is. And I have a feeling that if we made a list of the 32 best movies of all time and did a bracket on it, I think we could choose the greatest film of all time. Oh, well, that might be in the future for us. But for now, I want to hear what Film and Whiskey Nation thinks of this movie. Have you seen Citizen Kane? If you haven't, I want to hear what's keeping you from from seeing it. 
I want to hear some feedback on what you guys think of it. Is it the greatest film of all time? Or are you hesitant like me to even slap that name on a movie? You can find us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Film Whiskey. Or you can give us a phone call. Our phone number is 216-800-5923. Once again, that number is 216-800-5923. Or check us out, anchor.fm slash film whiskey. Leave us a voicemail right there on the website, and your voice will be broadcast to the world here on the Film and Whiskey podcast. Next week, we'll be moving into a small kind of mini series of movies from the year 2005. So we're going to be looking at the 15th anniversary of the movie Brokeback Mountain. Join us next week for that movie. For the Film and Whiskey podcast, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time.